Hey everyone, we are live. This is John Reed. I'm joined by returning champion Brian Summer, one of the all stars of Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio, a regular contributor. If you are missing his last appearance, you're going to get another one very often. So never miss Brian Summer. He's always going to be back around as long as we can suck him into it. Right, Brian? Yeah, I got to say the pay on this isn't very good, but uh, yeah. otherwise, yeah, happy to be here. The, the pay leaves a lot to be desired. The bonus part of that, though, Brian, is we have no corporate sponsorships or affiliations to bog us down. We can we can shoot from the hip. And today we're going to be shooting from the hip with Factory the Future Interactive blowout we are brian you and i are going to blow out so many buzzwords during this conversation by the time you're done we're going to have a smart factory up and running we're going to have additive manufacturing i mean you are not going to believe the touchless factory the future that we roll out today my paradigm is already shifting and i feel a pivot excellent. coming on any second now yeah go for it excellent yes we are gonna we are gonna pivot we are gonna pivot the hell out of this one man oh we got sandy low already Sandy, buckle up. We're just getting started. Uh, by the way, sorry to start a little bit late. And, uh, uh, and and of course, I'm bundled up like it's the North Pole, but it is the North Pole in Massachusetts. And I also had an outdoor misadventure. I'm not going to explain it, but let's just say that uh, I got to be bundled up today. But we're all good, and we'll make do with my ridiculous appearance. Brian, thanks for wearing a tie. I think that's appropriate, given that we're going to be talking about some important transformational topics today. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I want to really get into this from the vantage point of, uh, you know, we are going to do a countdown. Oh, I also want to mention to readers that uh, I picked out three uh, factory of the future keywords. Oh, we're hearing an echo from Brian's side. Is that so? Interesting. Sandy says there's an echo. Looks like, Brian, you're going to have to grab your headset there. One sec, folks. We got to deal with the echo. Sandy, once we get Brian's... Uh, Heads on, and we're going to test that again. Usually, the headset is the cause. Brian, can you hear? I can hear you on my headset. Yeah. Okay, Sandy, let us know if there's a continued problem. The headset should address the issue. Excellent. In just a few minutes, I'm going to unveil three factory of the future terms. If we can get Brian to use them during conversation, there's going to be a special surprise. We'll see how that goes. Um, but but in all seriousness, we really want to talk about this because, uh, all right, sound good, clear, excellent. Uh, Greg Robinette, how you doing? Uh, yeah, well, we're gonna we're gonna clear up the fog today. We're gonna, we're gonna clear that up. It, it, it's gonna be a futuristic futuristic factory. Um, but but in all in all seriousness, I think the importance of this conversation can't be overstated. Uh, we we've been relying quite heavily on our fragile manufacturing and supply chains the last number of months. We could talk a little bit about how manufacturers have recovered, but hopefully, in the process of adapting, we're also not just adapting and scrambling, but we're thinking about the future, a safe future, but also a future where we can meet the growing needs for safely delivered products. But what does that mean? And, and Brian's in a good position to tell us about it because Brian, you wrote, actually wrote a book on the factory of the future and you have some product experience uh, that you can share from the past as well. So uh, where do you want to start with all this as far as how do you do this during a pandemic? Like how do you, how do you track all this? How do you stay on top of it from your cozy back cave? Uh, it is not, without its challenges, that's for sure. Um, where a lot of factories are located, they might be where there's a, a large source of raw material, and that means it's not like in necessarily in your backyard. And getting to physical sites and plants and factories, whatever, is pretty much impossible right now. My current clients got operations in three or four continents, and um, we can't get to any of them. I mean, none of them. And so, um, you know, I got to tell you, the team I got working with me, we're real good about we can drop into a physical plant and within five, 10 minutes, we can pretty well see all the real issues that are going to get nailed down and just that fast. 
now we're having to rely on um, employees of the company walking around with a smartphone and taking videos of um, of everything out there from a production environment. Hello, Sandy. And um, it's not the best way to do it. I'll, I'll say that. But we're getting there. It's just taking a lot longer and a lot harder to do. The other thing we run into is, you know, a lot of times there are gaps or um, outdated documentation and getting it, getting access to it requires a lot of begging, cajoling, wheedling and everything. And you can finally get it. And then you got to figure out, is it right or not? And you may or may not be able to know that. Uh, it's a different world. It It's not, I, I don't want to say you can't do it. We're trying our best right now to get it, get it done at this one company, but it does. Uh, it does make things slower and harder to do. No question about it. Uh, Greg Robinette says, uh, is Leonardo going to join us today? That's, that's <laughs> SAP humor for you folks. Uh, Greg, I, I like, um, I like the humor though. That's a good one. Yeah. Greg, Greg, uh, the, the bad news is this is not a, not a particularly sappy show. So while SAP might come up, unfortunately, Leonardo is in the dustbins of history as far as the show is concerned today. So if that doesn't disappoint you too much, uh, but, but Brian, I just want to step back here on this factory. The future is, you know, we struggle a lot with this because obviously vendors have a vested interest in us buying into these concepts because it leads to the sale of a lot of fancy new software and technology. But in your mm -hmm. mind, what, what does a factory of the future look like? And is it a worthy goal? And, and, and how do you start along that path? Because you're not getting there overnight. So, so, why would a customer want to do this? Is it about eliminating as much human work as possible, cost control? Is it more about uh, just in time and flexible inventory? W w where are we gunning for here? All right, well, uh, here's the first. Let's have this mind expanding moment right off the bat. Uh, we need to think about how all this new technology that's available today, I don't care what it is, chatbots, machine learning, um, you know, IoT sensors and all this other stuff. When you really boil it down, what a lot of them do is they, they cut down the reaction time on things to instead of like knowing whether we made money or not this month at a plant, you now can know that like down to the day, down to the hour, maybe all the way down to a millisecond if you really wanted to. Instead of waiting to get a PL for the whole plant or the corporation 10 days after the month end, you can now, what companies want to be able to do is get real time PLs, if you will, by product, by batch, by whatever. And they want to get all these different slices. Unfortunately, when you look at a plant, where's, how do you know how much electricity or natural gas or water that you used in the manufacture of a particular batch? Well, you don't because they only have one meter. It's outside the building and it runs everything. And so you don't know what a lot of your direct costs are unless you actually go back in there and put additional readers, sensors, scales, and other technology so that you can find out all these discrete slices. Now, why is this important? It's important because uh, uh, Commodity pricing has gotten more volatile over time. We've had issues of shortages and the like, and we need com companies to change the mix of what they're doing. We also need to think about different ways of manufacturing things so that we are, are more in tune with where regulatory and consumer changes are moving longer term. For example, um, uh, I, was, I was surprised the other day, I was walking through the alcohol section of uh, my grocery store and for those listening, I was just cutting through there. I'm not stocking up on anything. Thank you very much. But I was I was surprised to see all these organic stickers on several brands of beer now. And organic and you know, and lower carbon footprint capabilities, whatever, you can't have that in a firm unless you measure it, you track the things, and you have traceability, uh, you know, that goes throughout the entirety of the value chain. I think a lot of companies right now struggle to know and trace anything all the way back to if, you know, if it's agriculture to a farmer, to a specific mine, uh, to a specific ship or whatever rail car, they would have difficulty doing that in a lot of firms because their data was set up along accounting periods, not in much more discrete kinds of timeframes. 
I'm more near to death, John. I can tell that the snort, the no, snort no, volume that, just fell off the cliff. No, that, here. Uh -huh. that's, that's helpful. I do have to address one thing, uh, Dan, around around my outfit. You may have missed this earlier, but uh, I had outdoor misadventure, so I had to bundle up. So it's function over fashion. But by the way, this jacket is your jacket that you gave me. So if I look like a hobo, it's because I'm wearing your hobo jacket. So sorry about that. Uh, actually, it's really comfortable though, so I appreciate wearing it today. Uh, Bonnie wants to check in on your your Dr Pepper supply. She's she's concerned about that the factory of the future might let you down there. Are you doing okay with your supply chain there? I, I've got that. And in worst case, I can go back up with one of these, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm good for this call. I'm absolutely good. Thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate the heartfelt touching concern there. Uh, yes. I've got plenty of Waco belly wash on hand for me. Um, absolutely. All right. So you've laid out like a lot of the, a lot of the objectives that a company might care about. I mean, I think one thing that jumped out to me was just the importance of data. It sounds like a big key component of this is building a modern data platform. Is that, is that how you look at it? Uh, somewhat. I mean, um, the most important thing any company wants to do, whether I don't care if you're in manufacturing or some other uh, vertical, you need to think about building uh, and acquiring technology that has convergence in mind. You want to think about where will technology be and where will consumers be and the environmental issues and everything. Where are they going to be in five years, for example? So what does the world look like in 2026? And are we actually constructing a technology environment that's going to be relevant then? Well, I can guarantee you whatever processor speeds and disk storage capabilities and hyperscaler capabilities are today will be probably four times that or 40 times that in five years from now. So we have the ability to use a lot more information. The question is, do companies actually have the applications, the technology, the algorithms, and everything else to do anything with it? That's the first deal. The second is companies really struggle with people telling me uh, like, but Brian, that's not the way great grandpa set the company up in 1907, you know, and I'm like, oh, my God, nostalgia is not a strategy. And instead, you know, what we need is we need people who are focused around. Uh oh, did I hit one of your hot words here today, John? Well, no, um, I like nostalgia is not a strategy. I'm writing that down. I think I might be able to use okay. that. Uh, okay, uh, but anyway, where, where we got to go is there is a um, people are used to changing in a linear pace, and unfortunately, technology changed and everything else. Any, uh, you know, anyone who's read like uh, Kurzweil's materials on the singularity, change occurs in a curvilinear or a logarithmic rate, and so. Uh, what I find is a lot of companies that are wedded to the past, they've got some people that just don't want to change. Here's another soundbite for you. I learned from a child rearing book years ago that children hate change. I mean, hate it. If you're the parent that always takes them to their soccer game on Saturday morning, they go, they do a meltdown if the parents switch off. And what I learned about employees, a lot of companies, they're nothing more than older children and they hate change too. And <laughs> That's nice. what one of these projects is all about. There you go. So if you want to manage a successful factory, the future project, take on some preschool responsibilities. I think we're really, we're, we're really getting that, there. Today, Brian. Uh, yeah, that's so, not where I was going with that, but yeah. okay. <laughs> hey, 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 Brian, should we do the keywords? Uh, yeah. You want me to uh, block yeah. out the camera? All right. So I can't see this. My Everything in my stuff is closed off. Okay. I put, I put together three factor of the future keywords. We got to, we're going to try to trick Brian into saying one of them today. Uh, so here's the first one. Hopefully, hopefully you can see that. Okay. Um, I didn't pick any, any of them that were too obvious. So up oh, my camera freaked out about that. Okay. Here's number two. Hopefully you can see that also. And then number three. So can so I look again? Yeah, you can look again. So let's see if we can uh, trick Brian into using one of these words uh, in the next period of time here. <laughs> Well, I'm uh, I'm anxiously I, I'm wondering, you know, knowing that you like music, you've probably got Pompatus in there from like the Steve Miller band. Uh, no, uh, there's no Pompatus of of uh, IOT. Okay, all right. And then uh, uh, there was one the Yes song one time, Coldacity. Uh, anyway, I love that word or that phrase. But all right, let's see if you can do it. And 
please all the listeners. Are there any companies who have the model? Are there companies uh, who have the model factory, the future Tesla, Apple, any, uh, any market leaders, Brian? I'm only going to comment on places I've been to. I will say this. I've been really impressed with um, how automated since you had Tesla on there, some of the automotive plants are from a full digital stream. Uh, Toyota has an incredible custom approach called TPS, the Toyota Production System. It's something to see if you have a chance to go through one of their plants. And, um, uh, and not only is it highly automated, but they brought all these other disciplines to bear. I happened to be on the um, shop floor at a Toyota plant and when uh, all of a sudden, uh, the entire production line in this 116 acre or so building just stopped. And we heard all this, um, we heard uh, an etude by Beethoven playing in the uh, on the PA system. And it just happened by happenstance. I was maybe 30 feet away from where that music was coming from. And I saw this like team of people just running towards that spot. And they were all quality people trying to f figure out why a weld was bad at that one workstation, that assembly spot. And there are people are there grinding it and smoothing it and touching it up. And others are documenting it. And they're figuring out how that happened. And I was really impressed not only with the degree of automation that made it a highly automated factory, but it was the attention to the quality management and quality uh, assurance mechanisms that were so intense. And sure enough, within 90 seconds, bam, the music went away and the production line started right back up again. It was pretty cool. Speaking of which, Den says uh, there must be a stairway to have them plant somewhere. Yeah, well, yeah, now, she's. Uh, and Greg Robinette, stealing nostalgia is not a strategy as well. He's intrigued by the concept of vision technology combined with tracking input costs, marrying it to real-time process changes. The hardest part will not be the technology, it will be the process change. Yeah, now, uh, I it's, it, I don't disagree with that. I will tell you that that varies in degrees based on what somebody makes. If you make something uh, that only, you know, you've got, you go through massive volumes uh, of things, you're probably, not, you know, heavily capital intensive kind of stuff. You're like, um, think like a wastewater treatment plant or a, um, uh, you deal in the agribusiness space, you're talking massive volumes of stuff, very few people. That you, you, It's hard to rejigger the process necessarily because the equipment involved is kind of, it, it is what it is. Um, I, you know, but the there are process changes that absolutely need to be brought in. And one of the best ones is to get people to put enough digital technology in these places where you can build a digital twin, not just to have that, but that you can make uh, the all the operations remote enabled, and you can make them in a much more safer environment for workers. I mean, if you can take workers off the shop floor where their ears aren't being destroyed by eardrums, by all the noise, um, that they can't possibly accidentally fall into a tank or something like that, get them out of there and let automated switches handle all that kind of stuff. That's really a good thing to do. So yeah, there's there are all kinds of benefits, safety benefits, uh, process improvement stuff, and getting people to make some of the changes. Yeah, that's all, the people end of it. It's always one of the more interesting ones uh, to wrestle with. Greg uh, added up with a comment on TPS there. TPS starts with effective processes to mold the newest technology around, kind of building on what, what you were just saying there. Yeah. Uh, if if there is a Toyota plant near you that does do tours, it's worth going there. I mean, it really is. Yeah, you may have to drive a little bit and give up better part of a day to go through there for about a three hour tour, but it's really cool. Den says that the Siemens beer plant tech is a maze balls. Their digital twin allows for all manner of recipe experiment. Sounds interesting, Den. Feel free to elaborate even further. Somehow, Dan at a beer plant doesn't surprise me. Uh, you know, I, I could see Dan doing an entire book on the best processes of beer companies. That seems like something he would be qualified for. Surprisingly enough, Dan actually has some beer beer industry experience amongst his considerable past endeavors. So, hmm. uh, you never know what Dan is going to come up with. Uh, 
Greg says we make ships the last 60 years and get refueled once. We deliver once every seven years for our signature product. Interesting. Hmm. So, Brian, let's new. go. Let's, as hmm? we go forward, let's work in a little bit of our buzzword countdown here. I asked you to come up with your five factory of the future buzzwords that drive you nuts. Let's do uh, one of those. Well, I cheated. I actually saw some stuff, but anyway, here's some of mine. I, I got to tell you, uh, every time I turn around, somebody is inventing a new as a service. And, you know, I'm sorry. Um, uh, most of that is just simply an accounting game. You know, we're going to we're going to spread the payments over time. Uh, there's no real change in what's going on. But I, I'm really tired of that one. Um, so anything is a service. So, so, so does that I, I, mean you're, are you, are you opposed to servitization then, Brian? Because that's pretty no. sexy these days. No, I'm not. I'm just, uh, I, I think the marketers have gone nuts over slamping as a service on the end of things. You know, it's, there's IOT as a service. There's, uh, you know, we got all kinds of cloud as a service things. We have a uh, hyperscaler as a service, like it was going to be anything else. And, and I go on and on and on, you know, and, uh, I'm, I'm just not sure that um, uh, I'm not sure that all that marketing buzzwordiness is helping move the needle at all. And it, it's just it's just marketing, bad marketing. Greg, you yeah. see Johnny, you're, Johnny, RP is the service. Johnny, RP is the service. Greg, that's what you're getting right now, dude. Uh, it, it is. It's delivered, delivered to you. Um, the the SLA leaves a little bit to be desired. Uh, but, you know, we're working on uptime. You know, John, you really need to jump out on a, oh, uh, you need to jump out on Twitter and get that handle at John ERP as a service while you still can. Although that takes up half your 70, uh, whatever, 140 characters. So Dan had a microbrewery. He owned a microbrewery when he lived in France. He was a popular guy. Even more so than now somehow. Yeah, handing out beers. But Brian, you wouldn't be opposed to Dr. Pepper as a service, I don't think. So it just matters. It, it all matters on the product. Yeah, yeah, it does. Well, anyway, uh, if you want to keep going on the buzzwords, the yeah, uh, give, another give one. Me, I, give me another. Yeah, give me another. Uh, another one. I, and now it's not terribly original here to say this, but uh, I got to tell you, agile just shows up everywhere. We need to create an agile business. We need agile technologies. We need agile development stuff. And uh, and along with that, you get all of its twins. We need resilient. We need all this other kind of stuff, which just kind of went into. Uh, thermonuclear hyperscaled overloaded orbit, uh, you know, b during this last year and because of the pandemic. Um, I, I don't think it adds to the conversation anymore. I think that's kind of like, yeah, we know it. Everyone needs to be agile, flexible, scalable, blah, blah, blah. You know, let's quit using the words and start talking about the value that's actually coming from this stuff. Well, and it also screws us up because then we can't have a, a really deep, precise conversation about the Agile methodology and what works and what doesn't in Agile as a true methodology versus just a phrase we slap around on everything. Um, Dan's throwing out business transformations service. I wonder how you got that one, Dan. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I guess um, we're back to Leonardo, Greg. Uh, oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> I think I heard a bunch of people's feelings with one comment there. I'm just going to leave that alone. But if Den's going to put in 50 hours on SAP this week, he has a right to say whatever the hell he wants. Um, all right. Um, hey, hey, Brian, I wanted to ask you back back to back to sh uh, the project realities because one of the things I really want to accomplish in this discussion is to help folks better understand how to move towards this as as a project. Um, you, you talked about the importance of real-time data, real-time equipment, real-time sensors. So how about real-time sort of project success milestones? In other words, I mean, obviously you might not get that every every day, but is that also something you're trying to work on as far as like, how do we gauge whether we're on track with this, with this endeavor? Ooh, uh, there's definitely a role for that as you continue to bring on um, – you're not going to be able to bring every plant on and every piece of every plant on every time. And I see Greg still working the typewriter. I mean, the type pad uh, pretty heavily right now. Um, but you can't bring everything on at once. So, you you know, this stuff is going to have to get rolled out. There's going to be a phasing in of things. Uh, I will tell you, though, 
you have to spend some quality time actually up front thinking this thing through. And I'll give you some examples. If you are now able to collect um, materials, cost, uh, volumes, um, utility costs, fuel costs, transportation costs, um, and, 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 and in very discrete pieces, my question to you is, has anybody gone back and really looked at how you do cost accounting in this firm? And is your inventory accounting still relevant? And I could go on and on. In fact, it turns out that if you're going to be able to enable these capabilities at the plant level, all of a sudden you've got to go back and rethink what have we done at the intergalactic level at like corporate HQ and the corporate accounting systems? Do we have to do some serious refreshing there? And there's some master data management challenges you're going to have to address also, because as you collect this information, you got to make decisions about where is it going to reside and what are we going to do with it? And how do we move this stuff uh, or pieces of it up and down, back and forth through the organization, organization in a way uh, that's going to be relevant, useful going forward? And then we have all the phasing issues that you're kind of alluding to, John, you're, you know, about as we bring this stuff on board, we want to be able to uh, turn capabilities on as fast as possible. Uh, but we got but, but there has to be some place for this stuff to go. And that's a, that's a critical thing to really get nailed down right off the bat. Um, One thing I wanted to ask what, you. About, oh, go ahead, Brian. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> When I saw that, I, I, I know people make fun of my initials, and I was wondering if that's what Dennis's uh, message here is all about, but uh, or is he the more literal view of BS? But anyway, we'll, we'll try to deliver some BS as a service before it's all done. Sorry, Brian, continue. You had a train of thought around that. Uh, I, I, I lost it. Um, well, one thing I wanted to ask you about is is obviously manufacturers generally can't function without being in the context of a larger supply chain. And one of the big themes of the of this year has been supply chain disruptions and what, if any, lessons can be derived from that. Um, and, and obviously, there's a lot of discussion around, should we regionalize our supply chain? To what extent do I need redundancy? Because obviously, people, I think people are rightly thinking that this is not the last time that we're going to experience some type of major disruptive event. And while supply chains have basically largely covered at the moment, um, there's there's tons of kind of hard knock lessons from all of this. W what have you been hearing and, and how does this fit into this whole, whole project that we've been discussing today? There have been a bunch of, there, there have been a bunch of other smaller kind of uh, supply chain disruptions in prior years. And I think uh, procurement people in particular have been learning some very important lessons. I'll give you an example. A few years back, um, I was for some reason, by the luck of a draw, I was doing a lot of work with several utility companies. And I started asking the procurement people at different ones, where are you buying all your transformers? And the answer always was China. And then I, I kept pressing on specifics. And it turned out that pretty much uh, eight out of 10 or 18 out of 20, whatever uh, utility companies were all buying about 95% of their transformers from two companies in China. And I go, what, ha what happens if there's a tariff problem or one of the suppliers has a major meltdown like that happened with a chip manufacturer in Malaysia years ago? W what's your plan B? And, uh, and what struck me was their incredible lack of knowledge about the supply chain. They didn't realize that all their competitors were also buying from the same limited supply base. They didn't know that. And that was a critical item, uh, you know, for their firms to have access to. And almost immediately, I noticed a bunch of those companies found some suppliers in Mexico, and they started moving about 20 to 30 percent of their production uh, requirements. So they were having it being filled out of Mexico because they could truck that stuff across. But if there was a tariff or governmental issue or whatever with the, one of those two suppliers in China, they didn't want to be completely vulnerable. So what we have right now is I think we have an opportunity for companies to really, really get in and understand the supply chain that they have, but also to understand that of their competition and figure out a new level of vulnerabilities that exist out there and to develop um, antibodies. How about that? Uh, you know, to to deal with those potential threats. That's one. Yeah. And one other interesting component of that is, 
is shifting business models, right? Like as, as companies look to go direct to consumer, as they look to kind of do smaller batch runs, that that can also motivate change. I did an interview with Burton Snowboards last week about this, and I asked the supply chain manager there, like, if, if, if she was being provoked into transformation, or is it just like a buzzword that the vendor was promoting? And she said, well, we are getting pushed by consumer changes in demand, and that that could actually really change how we do things. Because we used to, like, like Greg referred to his, you know, seven-year product lead up. They, they largely have a two-year lead up, but they realize like we actually are going to need to get that down to one year in a lot of cases, and that's going to force a lot of disruption in how we do things. So I thought that was an interesting point as well, that disruption isn't just like force majeure type events. It can also be changes in business models and consumer demand mm-hmm. and wanting to be, uh, I don't want to say the word agile, but wanting to pirouette, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> into wherever the demand is. <laughs> So you bring up a very valid point and something I've been doing a lot of thinking on. Um, it, it seems like we're getting to a point where the idea of building a physical plant for manufacturing the way like Ford did at the Ru- River Rouge facility around World War II, the, you know, I mean, it was massive. They had ships unloading iron ore and coal, you know, off the Great Lakes and making, you know, finished automobiles at the end of the plant. The day and age for that kind of stuff may be coming to an end. Um, And bear with me on this. You're right. Consumer choices are changing rapidly, but also innovation is changing such that a product you make today, you may not want to be making it in five years from now. So the question comes up, how much do you want to invest in physical plant infrastructure and how nimble do you want your production operations to be? But there's also an underlying current where if you're in like food products, you need to have traceability and you need to be able to prove, you know, and you may want to make things in small batches. If Den was in the still in the microbrewery business, I'm sure he would be all over like, where did this crop of uh, barley, wheat or whatever come from? And uh, do I know the farm? And do I know that, you know, non-GMO grains were used? And do they... Uh, have some kind of, you know, what was their carbon uh, mitigation kind of uh, program in place? You can't do that when you've got facilities that were designed to unload, you know, ships worth of raw material that may have come from thousands of different sources. And you're going to try and uh, maintain some kind of uh, traceability and audit trail on, on the, all that kind of stuff that comes in and goes out. It's not possible. So we may be forced to come up with smaller, nimbler, and disposable kind of manufacturing operations over time. Absolutely. Uh, and Greg says that, uh, actually, he says that um, the pirouette was on his home home buzzword list. So two points for him. That was actually me, not you. But we'll still give him some. There you go, Greg. <laughs> well, well. Done. Yeah, you got it. You got to show me what's on that list by the time we get to the end of the call, because uh, apparently I'm not hitting anybody's marks on this. I will tell you, though, I, I did see there are some words out there uh, and buzzwords in this space that uh, I even scratch my head over, like multi-experience, like whatever that is. And uh, um, uh, the Internet of Behaviors. OK, so, I, you know, we got lots. To, we got we still got lots to work through here. Uh, Brian, I gotta actually interrupt because uh, we got uh oh, we got a problem oh. now. Blockchain is the magic bullet for Den's sourcing traceability. Actually, Greg, unfortunately, uh, that's a violation of the rules of the show. Uh, I've, now, <laughs> I've now prohibited the use of the word blockchain officially on the show unless it is used in the context of a live, scaled-up production environment in enterprise setting, which we have yet to hear. So. <laughs> Sorry about that, Greg. It happens. You, you you couldn't be expected to know that. I just added that rule last week. So um, anyway, I do want to get to a more serious question from Greg, though, which is um, uh, what's the SCM risk and how much do we limit the risk by redundancies or larger inventories or what? One thing I can tell you, Greg, in the, in the manufacturers I've talked with is that larger inventories are off the table. That is not something that companies want to get into again. They're looking at anything but that as far as I'm seeing, but... Brian, what are your thoughts? Um, uh, they're not going that direction if they can at all possibly avoid it. Um, what again? They're looking at um, 
One thing they are looking at is trying to find ways to better place uh, production, raw material, and even finished goods inventory closer to the actual end consumer. So there is there is some thought on that. It, but you got to remember, I mean, let's let's face it, folks. Uh, most manufacturing plants have a uh, depreciation life cycle of 38 and a half years, I believe. And many of the plants I go to have been there at least that long. What's interesting is uh, we're not going to see wholesale movement of some of these things. What we may see are decisions about where to allocate the capital for plant improvements and or possibly opening up some, you know, like Maquila door operations to supplement stuff if that's if that helps solve some of those problems. Uh, Greg said the B word looms very large in traceability, especially in food and pharma supply chains. Yeah. And when it's actually live at scale, we can discuss it right now. It's not, so it's not being discussed. Um, <laughs> then we can revisit it. Um, but I, I won't disagree with you though, Greg, I think food supply chain is an area where it could come into play. So, mm -hmm. yep. uh, Den, Den says, um, we buy meat from cows that are traceable, but it's remarkably difficult to scale. Yeah, that uh, here's a classic. Uh, I mean, not to be gross, but cattle are often bought and moved through in large numbers through um, meat processing plants. You may know which cattle went in there, but which ones, you know, ended up in uh, the, the package of ground beef you got uh, could be from all kinds of different group uh, cattle. And... Um, you know, are you, you know, how do you trace that back unless you stop the production line to come up with like units of production that are directly attributable to like one or five, whatever, you know, head of cattle. It's tough to do it. You know, Dan's exactly right. You can, you can know which cattle en entered into the, into the processing uh, cycle, but uh, pinning it down gets really tough depending on the cut of meat. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, to me, the whole thing is is intriguing. I mean, if you believe the hype, today's like ethical, conscious consumer is going to place a premium on premium on that type of information. The interesting challenge is how much you can expose and at what points, right? I mean, you know, I, I would think a consumer would want to see a lot of visibility throughout that process. Now, they might be a little squeamish about actually picking out the cow, and 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 seeing it go right. into. Go, go into yeah. the, the retirement phase as a living cow, for example. Uh, but 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 that's, to me, part of the problem is that that data platform then needs to get exposed to the outside as well. So it's not going to be an easy thing to tackle. And it's not necessarily cheap. Let's get let's use let's switch to a, um, a, a grain crop, because on that one um, in the grain side, you've got a lot of things to consider. You know, what were the farming methods that were used? Was it no-till or what have you in the fields? Did they, uh, has the crop been treated with fungicides? Uh, did somebody spray a uh, glycosphate or some other kind of herbicide around the perimeter of the field? Uh, are you picking up trace elements of any number of different chemicals and compounds? And that's, to think about, you got to do that for every farmer's field, and you got to do it for all the farms that contributed their grain. They sent it all to the same grain elevator, for example, where it got commingled. And it's the commingling where things get really kind of tough to do. And we had this commingling pro problem because decades ago, when most of these facilities were built, they built like a handful of really big silos, as opposed to a bunch of small ones that could hold like a single farmer's crop. So you're I I applaud the idea of having that kind of traceability. I'm just telling you that practically speaking, none of the real infrastructure that we have was really set up for that world. Uh, again, so why can't we have a blockchain that stores transactions that don't need to be trading money, just information data points that are cast in stone? Just just real quick on, I, I, I'm, I've been kidding a little bit about the blockchain thing, but I'm also serious just because the focus of the show is on practical things that work now on projects. And one of the issues, if we talked about this, would be why people are always throwing blockchain at a problem. For example, there's all kinds of distributed ledger technology. There's all kinds of databases. You have to really drill into what's special about blockchain. And I don't want to have that discussion because we're talking about you know, actual project realities right now. So I'm not trying to be a jerk. It's just that's the focus of the show. There's plenty of shows that hype the future of a blockchain. That's just not what I'm about. So I hope I'm not disappointing anyone. 
Um, okay, and and Den likes the Monsanto uh, use case for Brian's points. So, Den, feel free to uh, elaborate on on that in the comments if you want. Um, and Greg says, if plants are end of life for depreciation, reinventing a more modular set of smaller plants in the same transportation region to replace them might provide significant benefits as a chance to build out new technology in a lower risk profile. No disagreement, uh, but I would tell you that uh, a lot of companies are in industries that have low margins so and they're high capital costs to build facilities. And some of these facilities, when you get into them, you realize like, okay, well, that building was there when the thing was originally uh, set up 70, 80 years ago. They've done like three and four additions, and some parts of the operation may only be like five years old. So um, I'm just laying out there that boards of directors sometimes are kind of loath to say, okay, let's go dynamite the whole thing and start all over with a different kind of deal or greenfield uh, when they've got a perfectly good facility, but it was it's just not – it wasn't designed for a low batch kind of world and a highly volatile world that we live in today. So we've got this tension, you know, where uh, to do what was just suggested takes capital. And the question is, do companies have the capital appetite to make that happen? Uh, there are some cases where I've gone to companies and it it's obvious in five minutes, they've got to, they've got to go build a greenfield somewhere else because you're just not going to be able to make, the kind of fundamental and structural changes on the existing facility uh, that are going to allow uh, them the kind of capabilities they want. And the other problem, and this is a real problem, guys, is how do you make these changes without just any of these factor future changes in an existing operation without screwing up the current operational or production um, environment? And you got to be able to do it in a way where it doesn't cost them uh, customers and product quality and everything else while you introduce it. And if you're going to try and do one of these shifts in the same facility, you've got to take that entire facility down and it could be out of pocket for a couple of years before it's ready to come back up in a different kind of uh, life, life style. Uh, Bonnie's asking about the SAP rise announcement. Bonnie, uh, if we have overtime, I'll get into that a little bit, but I just really want to stay focused on factories and projects right now because there's so much airtime being given to rise already uh perhaps more than it deserves to be honest with you uh i would point you to diginomica and den how den's in the chat he might be willing to chat with you about it too den's written some detailed articles on this topic as well um uh brian i wanted to ask you in terms of like getting started on these kinds of projects right now obviously the pandemic creates specific difficulties around this type of project this is not a typical cloud project where you don't have to you know, people on the ground necessarily. Um, and I know you're trying to cope with that a bit. Is it realistic to move these projects forward in this environment? And if so, what, what, are, what, what kinds of safety precautions and things you need to do in order to keep these things going? So here's a couple of things you got to think about. You might want to create a, um, uh, either a virtual SWAT team or whatever, but you need to get out there and find out everywhere where you're going to want to add like sensors, valves, gates, relays, whatever, so that you can uh, finish automating out the the an entire production process. And what you're going to learn is you don't have uh, most companies have acquired uh, you know other locations or facilities or they were built at different times. Most companies have a um, an amalgam, a, a collection of dog dogs and cats, I guess, of automation technologies. There's very little standardization uh, in a lot of cases, and you're going to need to find out what do we have to do at every one of these. You got to do this like inventory of everything we need to put together. You can have small groups going out there and actually uh, getting plants wired and ready to actually then turn on and use some of these technologies from uh, like um, Aviva, which used to be Wonderware, is one example where you can get uh, human machine interface technology. You've got the graphical displays so that you can actually control equipment remotely. And we'd go on and on. You need to have a great information plan to figure out where we're going to get the data, where is it going to stay, what's going to be local, what moves up to headquarters. Um, you need another group working on all the accounting issues, believe it or not. Um, 
and uh, the new kinds of reports and briefing books and things you want. There's a ton of projects that have to get done, and many of them are not going to require travel, but what they require is a lot of great orchestration and collaboration across the enterprise so that people don't just hurry up and put something in. What you don't want to do is be doing a bunch of um, packagectomies where you pop out an old ERP and put a new one in without changing any of the core functionality and the assumptions behind it. The business will be different. So therefore, we need we need to have the, the ERP configured differently as well. Okay. Dennis stepped out. I hear you, brother. We need we need a weekend. We'll, we'll be good. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, a serious question for Brian from Den. Has there been significant progress from the days when Ford implemented RDIF? How about RFID? Well, yeah, let's go with RFID, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the big, what you hear right now, the, the whole conversation is frankly now is about, can we put 5G um, capabilities throughout the entire facility and uh, you want you want the ability to move tremendous volumes of both video and data everywhere you go. The the RFID was, you know, mostly a uh, you know think of it as kind of a chip to track something as a move through process. And now we want to use other technologies to track and carry a whole lot more information at an even greater level of granularity. There's trust me, uh, Dan, you're right to ask the question because. A lot of companies still have great use cases for it. Um, try and find, for example, uh, parts and vehicles sometimes at um, in the uh, warranty yards or whatever, the incomplete yards at some of these big manufacturers. RFID works real well uh, to get that. Uh, tracking equipment in a hospital, RFID works real well for that also. But, you know, uh, 5G is the backbone, I think, on where most folks want to go for the communication aspect of it. And that's because they want the sensor device or the relay or the switch. They want to send all the communications through 5G. And, of course, you've got CIOs who are worried a lot about um, the security of anything going over a wireless environment like that to make sure that it isn't exposed to hackers or anything else. Because the last thing you want is a hacker who's releasing, uh, you know, bulk inventory, uh, you know, like dumping it like on a shop floor because they figured out how to get access to your telecom kind of environment. So we got, a, we got a, here. Thanks, Greg. Uh, thanks, Brian. We got a cool comment from Greg. Thinking of our shipbuilding factory, we have actually approached this issue a bit. We have found that build work done in the ship costs eight. Build work done in a states area called the platen costs five. Build work done in a shop costs one. So we're building more large modular ship assembly facilities and more crane capability to move the assemblies. You gave me a new way to think about this effort. And that folks is, is why I wanted to do this show is, is to, is to really have provocative discussions that would help people have better projects. So, so thanks, Greg. And, and it was years ago, but I was at the bath iron works and I was amazed how they built ships there. They, basically built them in huge sub-assemblies and they built most of it upside down because it was easy for the welders to weld, if you will, weld right to the the ceiling, if you will, by facing down. And then they would use cranes, to lift that up and put the ship together in like big sub-assemblies. It was very efficient. Uh, so I, I think these are right. Brian, I want to get to any of your final buzzwords that you can't stand. But before we do that, I wanted to ask you one question uh, that's on my mind. Uh in the number of years prior, this year didn't happen, but for many years, had the chance to at Plex events to visit uh, factories and shop floors of their customers. And mm -hmm. invariably, invariably, what would happen during the during the tour is I would veer off because you know I like to veer off. I'm kind of a veer off kind of a guy. <laughs> and and there would always be a monster piece of equipment that was as old as anything, and it was the most valuable piece of equipment in the whole plant, right? Um, yep. huge, hugely expensive, very hard to fix and maintain. Um, and, and interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, hardly ever connected to any kind of predictive maintenance scenario, often not right. even connected to an MES system, definitely not connected to any kind of cloud ERP system, even a cloud manufacturing system. And you would ask them and they'd be like, oh, we'd love to have this connected. 
we so now you have the most expensive valuable piece of equipment that's central to that plant's concerns and that's the one that they're terrified if it goes down and it's not connected like like your point around data it's not connect, connected to the data infrastructure so isn't that a core part of the problem here with the factory of the future is getting these old workhorse pieces of you you can't even call them legacy equipment because they're so important to that to that manufacturer the cynical part of me would say it's hard to move into the factory of the future when you're living in the past. I get that. Yeah. But uh, but I also know that uh, I've seen that kind of I've seen that equipment all over the place. Giant stamping machines. Uh, I love the ones that were made of that old kind of uh, iron and steel that have the big embossed letters coming out on the side and along with the patent date and everything else. And you realize like they're. There hasn't been anybody in this building in 60 years that was around when that machine was made. Now, yeah, there are some machine um, uh, By automation the way, just, vendors. Just to, quickly, just to quickly interrupt, Den says some Heidelberg, Heidelberg printers that are 100 plus years are still running and producing stuff. Yeah. So. And, that, you know, I, I get it. I've seen, like I said, uh, stamping machines, presses, whatever. I've seen that kind of stuff all over. And there are some companies that can find ways to um, uh, wire up aspects of those machines. It, and the question comes, is it cost effective to do so? I, I was at a plant here locally that had a bunch of machine tools that were, I, I looked at them, I was just astonished how low to the ground they were. And I found out that all those machine tools were bought during World War II and put into this factory in a recessed cavities in the floor because women were the ones that were going to operate the machine tools for the war effort. And they're still sunk in that concrete to this day. I mean, you know, there's all these grown men hunched over working on a bunch of them right now. And you find all that kind of stuff. It's not connected and it's not going to be probably uh, for the most part as companies get around to changing out their product lines, they'll shift support for certain products over to those old lines uh, with the intent of bringing in um, uh, everything from 3D printing technology and CNC machines to do the newer products. And they'll start phasing that stuff out. Brian, did you say PLC technology? No, I didn't. I said CNC, oh. uh, and you didn't trick me into saying those letters either. Oh, but anyway. <laughs> oh, come on. Well, instead, could I get you to just read Greg's comment at least? Go there. Um, uh, with our something, I can't read it. Uh, you know, our. Oh, man, our gotta be able to read that one word. <laughs> that's, that's the word I need you to read, man. You are tough today. Oh crap! Yeah. Oh, um, we're gonna have to try. And, uh, man, that means I have to give away another one of John, my words, though. John, you've seen me with vendor deals. I mean, you know, I, I pay attention to those kind of details. That that yeah, just seemed know. like too good of a setup. And Greg, kudos to you for trying with that with that with comment. Our, you know, it says with our three D modeling, our digital twin for aircraft characters to find some process to build the assemblies. They are rarely done in the aspect that they end up in when the ship is delivered. Anyhow, that Greg's comment contained one of my buzzwords, but life goes on. Uh, Den says, for some industries, that stuff is cost-effective, referring to heavy-duty legacy equipment, sand plant mm -hmm. foundries, for example. He yeah. says he knows this because he owned a foundry engineering company where we recycled that stuff. I mean, basically, every uh, scenario we've discussed, Den was involved with at some point in his career, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm starting to think some of this can't be true. I mean, he's he, apparently he's a vertical industry guru in every vertical we've talked about here. I'm waiting for him to uh, volunteer that he owned, I don't know, a cucumber farm in New Zealand. And I'm waiting for some other things to come up, you know, but anyway, we'll see what happens. We shall see. Okay. Uh, Brian, any, uh, in, uh, yeah, yeah. Greg says uh, digital twins are good. Good buzzword. Yeah, yeah. That, I could have put that on my list. Unfortunately, Greg, I, I had to pick three and I didn't pick that one that kind of wish I had because I would have been able to get that about Brian used that about 10 minutes in. So yeah. Den said he hasn't owned a cucumber factory, so I guess we, <laughs> <laughs> we can draw the line there. <sighs> Brian, were there any uh, buzzwords you wanted to finish getting off your chest or did we cover them all? I think we're good. Why don't we go to um 
why don't we take some of you know, you know bottom line folks um it's time to kind of do a transition here anyway I, you know these are projects you need to start early um you need to you need to really get out there and see what is the art of the possible but you need to build towards convergence if there's one thing i really wanted to make a point about is think about where the world's going to be in about five years not just on technology but on uh, macroeconomic factors and governmental trade things, whatever, and the environment. You want to think about, how are we building towards that kind of world? If we're going to wire this up and do this right, and then start getting the right help to figure out how we how you reconfigure some of your um, uh, ERP and accounting connections and technology. Anyway, do all that. It, there's you You have to have a plan. This is not like a little project. You pop something in and out. Um. Yeah, I wanted to touch on, Brian, you, you sent us a few notes, uh, which I think was really, really helpful. I wanted to hit on just a few that really jumped out at me from your project lessons perspective. Okay. Uh, uh, one of the big ones, unfortunately, most of your accounting and cost accounting isn't up to this level of detail. Uh, you made that point early in passing. I think that's a really big one. Yeah. Yeah. Um... It's kind of sad. I'll have conversations with folks and I'll find out how do you know what a batch cost, for example? And they're like, well, at the end of the month, we look at all of our costs and we add them all up and divide them out uh, or allocate them over all of the batches that were produced. And I'm like, really? I mean, you know, so I, you know, I learned, um, I learned accounting where you want to know things like down to the batch because you may have scrap. You've got uh, different kinds of uh, utility and raw material costs associated with every different kind of batch. And you want to know, are we making money on some of these or not? And then I want to tie those uh, all that cost to the revenues. What are we getting for the uh, top line income for from a uh, customer as we sell this stuff? And are we making any profit? You know, or what's our gross margin on this stuff? Do we have some dogs in our product line? Um, and then you can, if you really got time, then you want to go back and relook at what are we throwing in the overhead bucket? And should we, could we do a better job of uh, pinpointing how much of that overhead belongs to very specific kinds of items uh, that we produce? And, and do we want to have a different way of, uh, sh you know, spread that overhead out. There's a vendor. I, I've not covered them for Diginomica, but I've known about them for a number of years called uh, Profit Velocity. And I'm not giving a plug. I'm just saying if you really want, if you're really into some of these like cost accounting issues and how they can materially impact your way of thinking about which orders we take and everything, that's one that people ought to go look into. Yeah, I also liked a couple of your other points. You talked about appalling lack of visibility into customer orders, which is obviously not particularly mm -hmm. helpful when we talk about predictive demand. That's that's not not a good start there. Uh, and and most struggle just to do the supply chain. Um, so, you know, to me, to me, like my big takeaway from this discussion is that you buy into factory of the future as a model. You even talked about the virtues of a digital twin, but it also sounds like there's huge gotchas and practical concerns that are that are very serious to undertake here that that make these projects no simple success. Yeah, I'm not trying to be a downer, but I, but I will tell you guys, what I was looking at, of all things, Gu, um, Gartner Group's uh, hype cycles. You, you, you know what we're talking about on those? You know, the, oh, yeah. where you see, yeah. So I looked I'm at a whole bunch of- I always find myself in the trough of disillusionment. I was trying to get out the other side. Yeah. Well, I was looking at those over the last several years um, because it was kind of interesting. You know, one of the things they have on there, and, and again, I'm not plugging Gartner. It's just a cool thing to look at is they're talking about which technologies are about to like, you know, where are they on the hype end? Where are they going to hit the trough of disillusionment when they're going to come out and start going mainstream? And uh, what I've what I'm doing is I'm trying to map where is my client right now on the technologies they're using? Most of the technologies they're using, they went out, they went out onto the mainstream 15, 20 years ago. And things like machine learning, chatbots, all that kind of stuff, which Gartner would tell you now in 2021, you know, they're probably primed and ready for mainstream. Yet my client won't get 
to those till probably 2026 or 2027, if they get to them at all. So, it, you know, we have this problem where you can, you know, the old Texas euphemism, want and getting are two different things. We've got a lot of companies that want to be, a, you know, have a factory of the future, but to get all the other stuff together that's going to make that a reality is, a, is quite a challenge. And there's a lot of enabling technology that you're going to want to take advantage of as part of the factory of the future because it's more than just IoT. It's all the algorithms you're going to need for, like you said, for preventative maintenance and the like. Uh, it's scheduling technology. Um, it's whole new ways of handling um, new requirements, whether they're environmental health, safety, whatever, and how they change around the world. And a lot of clients, what they want to become is they want to be able to have, the, they want the ability to see what's going on across the entirety of their organization around the globe. And they want it on a single dashboard, a digital dashboard where they can monitor what's really happening. It's time, and Dennis is right, it's really time to drive some material change here. Uh, this is not, it's not just about slapping sensors on and sucking a bunch of data up. That's just not going to be enough. That's not the change I'm talking about. Greg, Greg issued a pretty important comment, I think, that ties into this. He says, uh, our biggest impediment to significant process and engineering changes are often the supporting back office and transients. It is driven in part by our contract vehicles, but mostly by the failure to see the enterprise value. Often they only look at the cost and effort. They don't want to bother even if there are examples where the enterprise value exceeds their silo cost. So I think one of the keys to success in moving to a factory of the future is to bring along the, the support of finance and other back office functions. I think that's what he's saying. I had to finish the end of it yeah. for him. But. Yeah. Uh, no disagreement there at all. And you talk about one of the things I miss not being able to be physically out at clients is to sit down uh, face to face across the table with some of the folks in some of these back office functions. Talk about what is it you're going to need from like the workforce of the future to work in one of these highly automated uh, plants. It's a different kind of worker that's used to working with a whole new kinds of technology as opposed to somebody that runs down a gangway and opens a valve. That's a different kind of thing. And Den's right. Finance does hate change. Um, uh, I mean, boy, we're just getting all kinds of comments today. There's a lot of talk about C-level now, including a chief innovator, but they seem subordinate to the CFO. There you go. Um, I spend more time actually talking now with... Um, Chief strategy officers seem to be, you know, mm -hmm. gaining in power right now. Um, I, you know, finance shouldn't be the tail wagging the dog, and it shouldn't necessarily be driving things. It needs to have a spot being an equal par partner player in all this. And um, again, the way way I found things much more um, to get people to open up more about what they should be doing is here's a couple of techniques that work. One is I actually write a article, a fake article that looks like it's the cover story for business weeks, five year business week, five years in advance. And I talk about how my client has now achieved some major new success uh, in the market. They're now like number one, they went from number five to number one and they did it all in five years. And I work backwards and explain all the things they did to get them there. The inference being that all the other junk that they were doing, a lot of things they're doing right now, which are tangential to that and have no real long-term value, they quit doing those. Uh, and that gets people starting to focus on the destination as opposed to a bunch of little projects we're going to work on today. And when you start thinking about the destination, then you start getting clarity around how are we going to work backwards to achieve that in exactly five years. That's a tough one to do and a good exercise nonetheless. Um uh oh, go ahead. That's good. CFOs are gold, but there are people who go out on the plant floor. Yeah, they they need to get out there. Um, that's the only way you're going to know really what's going on. Uh, they also need to talk to the customers. It's fascinating to me how many manufacturers I go to can't give their own customers a promise date on when their product's going to actually ship out the door and start showing up at the client. Um, you take Thomas, something that simple that we solved by now. Hi, Thomas. How are you doing? Oh, Thomas, I owe you a read-through. I'll, I'll get to that after the show. Sorry I didn't get to that this morning. Is uh, is nearly every C officer sub to the CFO nowadays? So, yeah, suppose suppose so. Uh, 
actually just ran into that at Diginomica, but that's a sordid tale for another time. <laughs> I'm uh, glad I don't have to play in those uh, Diginomica politics. Okay. Bingo, Brian. Actually, let's let's talk before we wrap up on the project tips. Let's talk briefly about your comment that you sent to me on that 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 exact topic. Uh, in the advice lessons section I sent you, uh, you said get help. It can be a political landmine. Can you elaborate on that briefly? Yeah. Um, anyone executive, and this was to I forget who just made the comment about all the execs reporting up to CFO, but. Every executive has a finite amount of political capital, and uh, they've got to be very careful where they're going to burn it up in a company. And you're going to take on a project like this. Uh, I guarantee you, you're going to upset some folks in the status quo because you're you're making fundamental change. You're going to change the way operations work. And trust me, in a lot of big manufacturers, the operational execs, the ones who actually run those plants, they have a lot of power. And uh and they don't mind beating somebody down from time to time that tries to tell them how they're going to do things differently over there. So if you're like the CIO, you're going to try and exert change on the op side of the house. You're going to burn up a lot of capital doing it. So you might want to think about getting some help and you need to line up a lot of help because uh, this stuff's a this stuff is a big leagues whack-a-mole game, you know, because there's going to be dissenters popping up all over the place. And you got to beat them down along the way to get the get the vision done. You're going to need an army of people to help you make that happen. All right, then. Well put. I think we are nearing the end of our discussion, Brian. Were there any points that we didn't get to? Any any final serious questions from the audience on the Factory of the Future? Please get the serious questions in now before we go to our more humorous opening. <laughs> I think we beat this one up pretty good. Let's let's bring some humor into this thing today. So do, or do you want to go over the, the words I couldn't get you to say, man? I, I tried pretty hard. Sure, show them to me. What were the words? Well, I tried to get you to say uh, PLC. But oh, well, yeah. I thought for sure we'd get that one from you. Um, mm -hmm. Ani almost got you with Tesla because Tesla is indeed experimenting with the touchless factory. Uh, so I thought she might get you to go there. Uh, if, if Bonnie's still here, Bonnie, you came real close there. And then also um, I had, I had 3d printing. I thought maybe I did mention that. I did well, mention that. Did, did you get 3d? How did I miss yeah. that? Damn. Uh, well, you, I don't know. You were probably uh, checking emails or something. I, I got one. Okay. You got one. <laughs> Excellent. Well, the problem with this topic is there only there's only like 2,000 buzzwords, and you only picked three. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there's a, you know, a limited amount of time. We couldn't cover them all. Um, anyway. Yeah. Anyway, I think the touchless factory is right around the corner, Brian. We're, we're just about there, man. And not going to touch it. Not going to touch it. Okay. <laughs> Wait, so we have to um, do a couple of off-topic whiffs. Um, you had one going on about, uh, about Bigfoot. What, what was up there? Yeah, I love that story this week. While everyone's been talking about the uh, GameStop, um, you know, stock run-up stuff, the Reddit deal, I know that's huge news. And frankly, I've been kind of laughing right along with it. But the one that got my attention was some – a uh, state legislator down in Oklahoma is now wanting to, <laughs> and now wants to uh, sell hunting permits in Oklahoma. So people to encourage tourism in that state where you can come down and hunt Bigfoot. And um, I, I think that that showed uh, remarkable ingenuity, because if you can hunt Bigfoot there, I got a feeling someone's going to open up permits to hunt. I don't know, jackalopes in Texas and Elvis in Tennessee and who knows what else we'll be hunting for. That, And I know there's going to be some some tech company somewhere is going to have a user conference in a year or two when they finally reopen. And people are going to be able to, you know, have a, their own framed hunting certificate, you know, to let them go hunt Bigfoot. But why in the world would anyone think you'd find Bigfoot in Oklahoma? I'm sure it's part of the joke uh, that goes on there. But anyway, that was a cool story, I thought. Yeah, and I, I I have a few, but I'm I'm not going to do them all. But I had a had one with uh, with my Amazon device because I I asked for like what time it was I think, and it said they're like uh, in, enjoy the the sun. It's a sunny day today, and I and I was like, yeah, it's also 
five degrees <laughs> with, with like a 20 mile an hour wind blasting through, you would think that intelligent systems would be able to cross check with weather forecasts and not tell you, Oh, it's a sunny day. Get, get your ass outside. Yeah. I'm going to freeze my ass off five degree weather. Cause my stupid intelligent device told me to go outside. Come on, man. That's not right. No. And I'll say one other one real quick that I, 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 I'm i getting a little tired, but I'm going to call it, it'll be one of your kind of whiffs. Are all the vendors uh, that are still talking, they're, they're complaining that they can't have their in-person events. And I don't know about you, John, but A, I'm tired of hearing about the complaining, and B, I'm not so sure I really want to go back to Vegas or Orlando anytime soon anyway. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Like- <laughs> Who, who 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 misses Orlando at this juncture? Hmm. GameStop, yeah, just made a cat pick, yeah, exactly. Um, oh, and I also in the last hits and misses, I mentioned that uh, uh, a woman who Leaf is a woman. Double check. I tr- she charges up to three hundred dollars for snake massages that help people de stress and reduce pain. Over twenty thousand people have signed up. So, anyway, if you're a little stressed out by the pandemic, as we think we all are right now, uh, three hundred bucks. <laughs> get you a snake massage so well there's no end to the creativity out there and uh and unfortunately i work on the client side of the world where there's like a lot of resistance to change so anyway and somewhere between is the real world i guess um well brian maybe maybe snake massages might be a good icebreaker for some of these resistant to change individuals you know? When we when we get back to traveling, <laughs> I'll, I'll bring that up as a team a project team activity to kind of you know break the ice and get everyone to to a common kumbaya state. Yeah, okay. It, it, I'll if, think if nothing about else, it. if nothing else, it it's you know it's change. It, it's for sure going to be a change, and you know it beats the heck out of that old fashioned trust exercise we used to do at summer camp, right? Of like lean back, and your friends are going to catch you. You know, it's like yeah, 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 I know, I know the one, yeah. Dennis once yeah. said, for, thank you for your leadership. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> absolutely. It probably should have happened sooner, but Brian, I'm, I'm glad we could do that before we wrapped up. Thanks a lot, man. And, and I want to thank Dennis for thanking me for my leadership. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, what is it? Leadership. And that's uh, John's favorite word is leadership. And so thank you for that, Dennis. Appreciate it. Yeah. And, and, and Greg, just, just so you know, I mean, I think what, what we want you say the pandemic's a real news item we hate to bring up i actually don't really hate to bring it up but what what i'm trying to do is is bring a focus on how to how to get through from a practical perspective uh which is kind of what we try to accomplish today because these projects must go on right and and we need to have better projects in this environment how do we do it and but brian and i also believe i think that it's time to have a little bit of fun i mean there's uh, there's so many talking head video shows out there right now that are frankly just so stiff and boring and I figure it's a lot more interesting to argue with the people that post comments and and also like get into it with with my guests and hopefully do something fun and different. So that that's the goal. So yeah, we want to entertain, but we also don't want to put our heads in the friggin' sand either. It's just that we want something a little bit different. You know, next time if I ever get invited back, John, uh, I'd love for the listeners to volunteer some places uh to check out great barbecue or tex-mex food sometime uh because um when the travel does open back up again i yearn to go someplace instead of indianapolis where people i their idea of spicy food in indianapolis is salt and pepper and uh, i'm looking for something a little stronger than that but anyway all right all right our barbecue coming up anyway folks thanks for joining today appreciate all your comments in the chat uh, we'll, we'll be doing it again, and I'm sure I can talk Brian into coming back at some point as well. Stay tuned. Have a great weekend. Take care. Thanks, everybody.